The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning and good afternoon to everybody across the world listening to this UK IBC webinar. This is part of a series of webinars that we've been recently doing around topics that affect companies who are trading with India. Our recent webinars also looked at areas such as employment law, India 2024, what policies are coming up, the food and drink uh, sector, as well as banking solutions for companies who are entering into India. As you'll be able to see on the screen, there's our Twitter handle, so please feel free to follow us on Twitter, at UKIBC. We also have an excellent LinkedIn group uh, with over 5,000 members interested in the UK-India trade corridor. And finally, if you want to take part in our news, new newsletter, you can do that by registering on our website. How the webinar will work is we have a fantastic speaker from Alouette Associates who will be giving us a comprehensive overview of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Act and, of course, the recent amendments that have just taken place. And during the uh, presentation, please feel free to ask any questions that you wish. You're more than welcome to, to do that during the presentation. If you type them in, then what I'll do is I'll collect those at the end and I'll hand it over. Just to say by way of introduction, my name is Chris Hayes. I head up all of the financial and professional services here at UKIBC, and I'm part of the membership team here. And for the presenter today, we have a great uh, member of ours and a good friend of mine, Uday Alawat, who will be presenting. Just to give you a bit of an overview of Alawat's Associates, they're a full services law firm based in Delhi. They've been going now for over 30 years, and they address an array of legal issues, especially those relating to foreign direct investments, joint ventures, corporate compliance and governance, as well as advisory and supporting the booming startup ecosystem, which is happening in India, both looking at domestic and the international space. Uh, Uday joined Allo Associates in 2012, and he heads up the corporate commercial practice there. He focuses mainly on mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, corporate restructuring, private equity and fund formations. And he has had over a decade in the legal profession. Ode, we're really looking forward to the presentation. So over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone, whichever places you're in. Uh, uh, Chris has already given a very, I would say, a little exaggerated <laughs> introduction about me. So uh, I'll skip that part and straight away start with the presentation. Uh, I think, uh, are we wait, uh, should we wait for more people to join in, Chris, or should I just start off? We've got, we've got a, a number of people already on, yeah. So if we carry on, we're also recording this session. I should have mentioned that as well. So. Um, anybody who um, obviously doesn't want to take notes, you're more than welcome to actually watch this back afterwards at the end. Okay, perfect. So uh, uh, broadly, I mean, uh, I think this has been a huge talking point in India for the last three, four years, uh, the insolvency and bankruptcy code, because this is some something that address some of the biggest issues, especially for foreign investors when it came to India. Uh, especially to do with recoveries in terms of disputes because court cases were taking forever to decide and the cost was just i mean unmanageable beyond a point in most cases so i'm going to start with a brief overview of the act and uh, what it aims to resolve so it was passed in 2016 and came into force the same year uh, in may 2016 uh, the idea was to provide a time-bound resolution to recoveries, especially. Uh, uh, it doesn't deal with anything else but recovery of debt, uh, for which we previously had various authorities and various laws. Uh, we had uh, uh, restructuring boards. We had the SAFAC Act. We had the uh, debt recovery tribunals. Uh, some of them are still there, but now this is the preferred choice for all 
financial institutions, corporate uh, uh, corporates, and uh, individuals as well uh, for recovery. Uh, the the time-bound manner works uh, is set as 180 days uh, under this act, which is extendable up to 330 days. So the upper limit has been set. And the interesting part is this 330 days was also a very recent introduction in the month of August. Uh, and it includes any time to file appeals uh, with the appropriate courts as well. So no matter what, the process cannot go over 330 days. So any dispute, any re recovery procedure has to be completed within the maximum limit of one, uh, 330 days. Uh, any, anyways, the ma main time is 180 days. However, if it has to be with appropriate reasons if the time has to be extended to 330 days. Uh, we also have something under this code called the IBBI, which actually governs the liquidators who run this process uh, of recovery. Uh, this is still an evolving reg uh, uh, kind of a role where these guys are constantly coming up with new and new regulations based on day-to-day -day problems that uh, corporates would face or debtors would face in terms of recovery. So it's every few months, as you would see, uh, we have new and new amendments coming in. Uh, so August was one, December was one. We've already had some amendments come in in January as well. So that's how fast this, this is evolving. Uh, the act is applicable not just to corporates, it's also applicable to limited liability partnerships uh, and personal guarantors as of now. Uh, it's supposed to be applicable to individuals and uh, 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 partnerships as well. However, those provisions, even though they're already present in the act, have not yet been notified. So uh, till they are notified, you will still have to use your traditional methods of recoveries in terms of individuals and partnerships. But for the rest, you can now go straight, uh, straight under the IBC and start your recovery procedure. Uh, the interesting addition always uh, is actually the personal guarantor bit, because this was something that, I mean, a lot of us would have done at some stage. We would have just given a personal guarantee for a friend or, you know, uh, just anybody trying to help somebody out in obtaining a loan. And now it's there's a huge risk associated with it because if they are not able to re recover the loan from the person who's taken it, they will they can go after the personal guarantors as well uh, for recovery. Uh, the rate of recovery has been fairly high, as you uh, as you can see, uh, it's 43 percent, and uh, in terms of financial creditors, and 49 percent in case of operational creditors. Uh, the one thing that this doesn't, these stats don't show is that the moment uh, recovery proceedings are initiated under the IBC, a lot of matters do tend to get settled. Uh, that's because the code is so stringent that uh, people do not want to go down that route and they come forward for settlements. Unfortunately, that figure is nowhere available uh, uh, for anybody to ask, uh, access. So we can't give that. But yeah, so. It, I mean, but my uh, understanding is if if we put in uh, the settlement figures, this number should be close to 65-70%. Uh, we currently have about 21 benches uh, all over India uh, for this. And uh, we also have the appellate tribunal, which sits out of Delhi, uh, where any appeals go. And thereafter, if uh, any appeals from the appellate tribunal can go to the Supreme Court. Uh, the other big, one big financial advantage of this code, apart from the time bound manner of resolution is that there is no court fee required to be paid here. Earlier for any recovery, uh, depending on state to state, uh, you would be paying anywhere from one to 7% of the recovery amount, just as the court fee, which in this case is a uh, thousand or 2000 rupees now. Uh, uh, so it's negligible. So that has also saved a lot of cost for uh, you know uh, the people who are looking for, to recover their dues. Moving on to the next slide, uh, these are some of the brief objectives of uh, for which the code was brought into force. Uh, uh, and uh, as you can see, 
time bound and effective resolution was one of the most important things. Uh, it this actually helped India go up in the ease of doing business rankings over the last few years. This has been a constant factor of the uh, rank increasing every year. Uh, the other most important thing is the maximization of value of assets because uh, there is a comparative bidding process that happens uh, and the liquidator tries to derive maximum value out of the sale of the assets or as a going concern or uh, in uh, bits and pieces whichever derives maximum value he will go that way and uh, get the dues uh, this code actually follows a waterfall mechanism in terms of recovery wherein uh, the first claim on uh, the uh, the amount recovered goes to the financial creditors uh, and which is usually the banks or uh, you know the uh, corporate lenders but recently the court has also added the home buyers uh, in the real estate sector to the financial creditor category so they are the first one that uh, it goes uh, goes to the second goes to the employees uh, which is uh, whose dues might be still be pending in the company. Thereafter, it goes to the unsecured creditors. And most interestingly, after that, if any dues are left, it goes to towards the gum, payment of government dues. So the government has actually taken itself down the ladder and allowed the banks and financial institutions and the unsecured creditors to collect the amount first. And in, in a lot of cases, the government's actually had to write off its debt uh, in terms of uh, primarily towards taxes uh, in these cases. But it's actually brought in a lot of uh, confidence amongst uh, the companies uh, because now they know that the government is trying to promote recoveries and promote industry and allowing them to recover the dues in a fast and timely manner. Uh, these are broadly the steps that are uh, involved in this whole process. Uh, number one, of course, is admission of uh, uh, the uh, insolvency petition in the NCLT. Primarily, there is just one, one prerequisite in this. And as long as one is able to prove that, the application will get admitted. The prerequisite is that it should be acknowledged debt and there should be no dispute uh, regarding that debt. So now the usual way uh, disputes would normally work is the moment you would send a legal notice out, somebody would reply and create a dispute. Uh, the NCLT and the NCLT and thereafter the Supreme Court have all clarified that it has to be a prior dispute. Any dispute which arises post issuance of the notice is not a valid dispute for this purpose and therefore that the petition will be accepted and uh, notices would be issued thereafter then of course there is a moratorium period which basically means that all civil proceedings come to a halt and everybody files all uh, their claims here uh, they appoint a liquidator who is also referred to as the interim resolution professional uh, who thereafter uh, uh, publishes the uh, uh, puts in a publication in one of the leading uh, newspapers, uh, inviting people to submit their claims, and he also takes over the operations of the company. So he basically uh, takes over the entire management of the company, including banking and uh, uh, banking and day-to-day -day operations. Everything has to go through him. Thereafter, it leads to the formation of the committee of creditors who actually decide by the end of it which way, uh, whether the company is sold or whether the company is liquidated or its assets are liquidated. Uh, thereafter, the meeting of the COC happens and COC actually then thereafter confirms. So the current liquidator is actually just an interim professional, which is usually appointed by the NCLT when they pass the uh, application, uh, pass the order. Thereafter, the committee of creditors, which is usually the banks who would have the biggest vote, uh, would appoint their uh, a liquidator who will be the permanent uh, liquidator known as the resolution professional, and he would actually run the whole process. Uh, and thereafter, he uh, prepares the information memorandum for 
uh, inviting bids for the company or its assets and submits uh, the resolution plan for voting to the committee of creditors. And thereafter, NCLT uh, accepts or rejects the resolution plan only after 66% of the committee of creditors have approved it. So depending on how the voting goes, NCLT will pass an order accordingly. So this is a broad overview of the act. Uh, any questions, please uh, pass them on to Chris and we can, uh, on uh, the applicability of the act or the, uh, you know, any questions relating to how it actually works uh, as well, uh, pass them on to Chris and I'll take them up in the end. Now coming to the latest amendments that have been brought in. Uh, I wouldn't say latest because there's been one more amendment after that, which is not covered right now, but uh, I'm talking about the ones in December right now. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, uh, as everybody knows, is the real estate sector in India. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of real estate companies have been going down uh, and uh, it's it's become a huge problem in India. I mean, we, we are going through a bad phase in the real estate sector. Uh, a lot of the projects that were delayed, the home buyers had other forums to go to, but everything was taking a lot of time and therefore a provision was brought in to allow the homeowners uh, home buyers to come and fall under the category of financial creditors and initiate insolvency against the developers and the builders uh, sorry i haven't moved the slide yet uh, so yeah so now the only problem was that even one home buyer could come and initiate it, which was becoming a challenging part because uh, for a project which had 1,000 homes, one person initiating it would become a challenge. And therefore, they came up with the latest amendment that it has to be 100 home buyers. Now, the number 100, we are not sure how they came up with, but now there are issues with that as well because the same has actually been challenged in the Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court has issued notice to the uh, central government on this, so we are awaiting the outcome of that. But as of now, any new applications going in has to be by at least 100 home buyers for it to be admitted uh, for insolvency. Uh, all pending applications will continue even if they were initiated by a single home buyer. Uh, uh, so those, uh, it hasn't had an effect on those, uh, but all new applications have to be supported by at least 100 home buyers. Uh, as I mentioned, this has already been challenged in the Supreme Court and uh, we are awaiting uh, the outcome of that. Moving on to the next one, uh, next amendment. Uh, this was quite a critical one because uh, this was one of the biggest challenges in uh, set, uh, selling off any of the companies as a going concern. Uh, because a lot of the licenses used to get suspended because one of the biggest preconditions in most licenses uh, has been that the company should be solvent at all times. And the moment it went into the, the uh, insolvency process started, it triggered a non-compliance under the licenses and the licenses would get suspended or terminated. And there are, therefore, the price of that company would fall automatically, uh, if, especially if it was to go as a going concern because the new owner will again have to reinitiate the process of getting the licenses. So it wasn't a valuable uh, you know, a commodity to that extent when at the time of sale as it could have been. So keeping that in mind, the government has brought in this amendment where licenses will continue. So unless the committee of creditors decides that this company needs to be liquidated or its assets need to be liquidated per se and the company will not be able to be sold as a going concern, the licenses stay valid till, uh, till the process is completed. Uh, so this was a very, very important thing, uh, uh, is amendment for, to that extent as it incre started increasing the value of the companies which uh, had a lot of potential to go as a going concern. Now, the next amendment uh, uh, is where, with regard to the uh, offenses committed prior to the commencement of the CRP process. Now, here the challenge is there's still not 
a lot of clarity on the process. It is very clear that any civil offenses uh, which were uh, uh, which were committed prior will not definitely not uh, continue, or no liability will be there for that. However, all criminal offenses, since they are generally against an individual or a director in a company, uh, they are still continuing. So we still don't have clarity on this. And uh, uh, we've heard from the uh, uh, government that they, they will be coming out with some clarifications on that. So just to give you an example, a section 138, which is a check bouncing uh, case, is actually against any of the one of the directors of a company so it uh, usually it's against the director who is signed or who is in control of the company at that particular time when the check was actually signed uh, that still continues uh, irrespective of the insolvency process uh, apart from that uh, there is uh, again there is uh, no protection to the new management uh, uh, or the former directors again because these criminal offenses are still like i said there's still no clarity on this provision till now so hopefully we would have a uh, we would know better in a few days once the government clarifies its position on this uh moving on uh to the next one uh uh so these, as I mentioned, are the three major amendments that have come in through this uh, uh, in 2000, uh, nine, December 2019. Uh, and uh, this has actually enabled a lot of uh, existing uh, CRP processes also to derive better value uh, uh, from this, uh, from the whole process, which was not the case, say, six months back or three, even three months back. Uh, since we we were trying to keep the presentation short there were also some numbers which i actually didn't put into the presentation uh we've had some of the largest recoveries through this process in the last two to three years where uh the uh we the through this process we've been able to recover amounts as high as uh, 100 million dollars and uh in, in one case, in fact, it was uh, over uh, uh, close to about uh, $5 billion in uh, one of the steel plants uh, when uh, it went through insolvency. So this process has actually helped uh, keep industries alive, uh, allow banks and creditors to recover their dues in a timely manner, and uh, also save on a lot of legal cost as well. Uh, Coming from a lawyer it doesn't sound very nice, but uh, well, it has ended up saving a lot of legal costs to that uh, effect for the clients. Uh, lastly, just to summarize uh, uh, about this code and the amendments that have been brought in. Uh, the first, if you see the first point, this is actually what has actually changed with this, uh, with the insolvency code. It was always, a position that the debtor continued to be in possession and control and this has actually changed it to the creditor being in control of his debt uh, and given him the upper hand when it comes to recovery uh, again the time bound manner as i mentioned uh, is was uh, the second most important thing that has been brought in uh, i've already discussed the order of priority or the windfall mechanism uh, this was actually questioned by a lot of people. I had a lot of questions on this from a lot of people because uh, I think in most countries, the government dues are still right at the top and somehow our government has brought it down uh, in the ladder and allowed financial institutions and unsecured creditors to collect the dues first before they step in and start taking uh, uh, you know, their dues. Uh, Apart from that, as I did already discussed, the ease of doing business rankings have increased a lot because of this. Uh, the fifth point is actually very important. I mean, this was also done through an amendment uh, a while back, but uh, foreign creditors uh, were allowed to recover their dues. So even though even uh, foreign creditors who don't have a setup and have just supplied some goods uh, to uh, any Indian company can come and file for recovery under this uh, as well. There were a few uh, procedural gaps initially because they had to get 
uh, things, uh, a lot of documents approved or authorized by their banks, which also the Supreme Court has removed. Uh, so it has eased the process for foreign uh, uh, foreign companies to recover their dues uh, in, uh, from Indian companies, which was one of the biggest uh, challenges for companies in, uh, to do business with India. Uh, apart from that, uh, and as you can see, there is no difference between any, a domestic and a foreign creditor. They have been put on the same pedestal now, and uh, it allows the, gives them the same rights as an Indian creditor. Now, uh, so so broadly, this is the. Uh, I mean, these are the advantages or the main reasons uh, for this code to really come in. And uh, definitely it has in, improved a lot of investor interest in, in the country. It has given people a lot of confidence to do business in India. It has uh, allowed them to really come in aggressively without any fear, without any uh, uh, you know, impediments, uh, knowing that their funds would be secure uh, so yeah, so it's uh, overall it's been a big game changer for India uh, uh, in terms of foreign uh, foreign companies who uh, who come in. So yeah, uh, I think that's it. Uh, that's it from my side. Uh, I would now hand it over back to Chris uh, to take it up. Excellent. Thank you, Uday, for, for what was a very informative um, presentation indeed, and it was great that we were able to, to give some real-life examples. Um, I think you picked up on some quite uh, useful points there, particularly in terms of the ease of doing business rankings. Um, obviously, India has made phenomenal efforts at rising up um, at significant positions now to 63rd in terms of that world rankings. Obviously, from now on, every rank they want to increase becomes more difficult. Um, obviously, as there's some uh, sort of fundamental infrastructure changes that are needed in there. Um, I think it's interesting to see your perspective on how this will affect um, inward investors. Uh, businesses here in the UK do tell us, um, as part of our ease of doing business survey, which everybody is free to, to download off our website, that bureaucracy and policy issues are, um, are a huge barrier in India, but also is the collection of money. So, so it was great to sort of focus on that area. Just a reminder to everybody, you can ask any questions that you wish via the app. So please feel free to, to do that. Um, I'm going to start off, though, because uh, obviously I'm the chair and I have the right to do that. Um, so, Uday, just a, just a quick question about the sort of um, you mentioned about the onuses in terms of the home buyers now. And you mentioned now there's a requirement to receive sort of 100 or at least 10 percent. Um, so so, yeah. so I guess that makes it a lot more difficult for those homeowners then to go and find another 99 people who have that same challenge and issue. I understand, obviously, yeah. you don't want to, to have a whole litigation process around just one person. But at the same time, did you feel they've got the balance right yet? Uh, well, see, uh, for larger projects, it made it made sense to have that. I I think uh, where the government missed uh, missed a point was they the number the percentage should be determined by the size of the project. So just to give you an example, uh, JP is under liquidation, uh, and they have I mean about ten thousand home buyers. So collecting hundred would be a problem there. But then you have smaller projects of two three hundred apartments. So you uh, I mean. Uh, even gathering 10% there uh, in that case would be difficult. So uh, government's looking at it, Supreme Court's also looking at it. So I think uh, there will be a change on that front anyways. So uh, let's hope and, uh, uh, you know, we get some practical uh, results in that as well. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks today. We, we've got a question that's come in now, um, particularly relating to the, the, the CRP, CIRP slide, sorry, that you presented. And the question is about um, who files the insolvency petition with NCLT? Is it the creditor? Yeah, it is the creditor. Fantastic. That, that, that's cleared that up for us. Um, and I think just to uh, also add to that, uh, a creditor would be any person who has a debt uh, who is looking to recover more than one lakh rupees, so about uh, 1100, 11, 1200 GBP. Yeah. So yeah. So anything above that, uh, you can go uh, go for it. 
Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Um, and in terms of in terms of the strict time bound manner, um, I wanted to just delve into that a little bit. Um, are you seeing it to be an adhered to? Because obviously, when the legislation came out, it was 120 days initially, I think. Uh, but actually, there wasn't. I don't think there was any cases that were actually going through in that time. So, so have they widened that out then from 120 to 180? And 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 are you seeing that all of the cases are getting through in time? Uh, mostly. So actually, the uh, problem used to lie with the appeal process. At the moment. Uh, the 180 day process was over it would go into appeal uh, to the NCLT and the Supreme Court now that's where the actual time used to take even in during the process people would go and file some interim applications in the NCLT or the Supreme Court with the time bound manner this has put pressure on the NCLT and the Supreme Court to immediately decide on those applications firstly uh, yeah which sometimes used to take a lot of time so that that has become time bound and also uh, you know the moment uh, uh, the courts find that these are all frivolous applications i mean even they are rejecting it on the spot as well not allowing people to take advantage of it so it's it's definitely uh, things are moving in time uh, of course some cases uh, like for example the currently the jet case uh, you know it's a uh, this probably will get it be an exam uh, you know there will be some uh, exception to this case it seems because uh, obviously uh, there is uh, it is taking a lot of time there is a huge amount of debt and the process involved with the airline is such that it will need probably more time so so yeah till now they've been getting those extensions but on valid grounds the, the uh, resolution professional has to provide valid grounds for those extensions no, that, that, that's useful. Uh, we, we've had a, a couple more questions coming in, so pl please keep them coming. Uh, one of the questions is asked, uh, have, have you seen an increase in foreign investors then, increasing their investments in India off the back of this code, or, or are you seeing uh, new investors coming in? Obviously, part of the code was to, to try to create more reassurance for those investors. Are you guys actually seeing that? Uh, yes. Uh especially in the mid the mid level investments uh, as i would call them the 10 uh, you know the 5 to 50 million uh, bracket investments who are generally suppliers who are generally uh, you know uh, component manufacturers those kind of things you know for them it was always a big hurdle in terms of uh, getting their money because they, they were not that large to have uh, too many too much outstanding on their books so for them, it was a it was a big issue, and these guys are the ones who are now coming in. So, just to give you an example of the automotive industry, uh, uh, since we work with a lot of them, uh, a lot of the component suppliers are now happy to set up in India because they they are aware that their debts won't be outstanding for too long, even if they have challenges. So yeah, so they uh, so yeah, it has definitely increased the investment in the you know the mid. Uh, mid-level uh, uh, of companies. That, that, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've had another question coming in, which is relating to the. You mentioned before about the personal guarantors. Um, yeah. Do you think that the banks uh, are going to actually make use of the ability to pursue these personal guarantees under the IBC now, or do you think they'll actually uh, just let them go? Well, uh, I think the since the banks are going through a rough time i would see them go after it i mean it would i think depend on who the guarantor is uh, usually guarantors are somebody related to the promoter family or some in most cases so i would expect the banks to go after them and there's been no cases so far that that's happened though or no high profile cases at least uh well it's, it's only a month old so uh you know it's uh uh, I mean, it's not month old. Sorry, this came in August. So it's only about five, six months. So yeah, so uh, nothing as of now. No cases as of now. But uh, we, w I, I do expect to see a lot of cases here yeah, coming in. Excellent. Well, that's it now for the question. So all that's left for me to do is to say a huge thank you to Uday from Alois Associates for all his time and effort in putting this comprehensive presentation together, but also more importantly for breaking it down into. Uh, so it's a very, very complicated issue in sort of a nice, succinct way. So a huge thank you to that for that. In terms of uh, our messaging, just to let you know again that if you want to follow us, we are at UKIBC. 
and Alouet Associates are at Alouet Law. Please feel free to follow us. We have regular updates on lots of different topics. And as mentioned before, please also sign up for our newsletter. You'll get the monthly updates about future webinars that are happening, as well as getting vital information about the work that we're doing. So a huge thank you. And this webinar will actually be on our website from tomorrow. So huge thank you to everybody. And thanks very much for your time, Uday. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks. Bye.